Hello passengers, co-pilots, shotgun callers, blunderbuss bellowers, and midnight riders. Welcome to another episode of Full Moon, Empty Road. As always, I'm Jeremy, and I'll be your driver tonight. I uh, hope everyone had a great week. Actually, had a great couple of weeks, and I hope you're ready for another road trip. Um, it's been a, been a crazy couple of weeks, so kind of behind on my uploads and whatnot so i do apologize for that um hopefully should be back on my normal schedule of uploading on the weekends and i'm going to try and start uploading something and you know during the week but uh we'll see how that goes first before i actually commit to that but uh, that is the plan as of right now is you know stick with my normal stuff that i usually do on on the weekends and then maybe put out one or two little treats for you during the week uh just kind of you know just to scratch that itch assuming you are missing me <laughs> um hope you're uh hope you're ready for another road trip today um today i have for you another installment of dark words dark things and we are going to be going all over the place today and uh visiting some towns that the world forgot so without further ado I give you five haunted ghost towns in America. Our first destination will bring us to the Pine Barrens in New Jersey. Uh, these days the Pine Barrens is technically a national forest rather than a ghost town, uh, but I am going to put it on the list uh, because uh, during the colonial period it was a thriving place with sawmills, uh, paper, uh, paper making places and other industries of that time. The New Jersey Pine Barrens, also known as Pinelands or simply the Pines, is the largest remaining example of Atlantic Coastal Pine Barrens ecosystem stretching across more than seven counties in New Jersey. I almost said seven countries. <laughs> uh, the name Pine Barrens refers to the area's sandy, uh, acidic, nutrient-poor soil. Although European settlers could not cultivate their uh, family crops there, the unique ecology of the Pine Barrens supports a diverse spectrum of plant life. Uh, that includes orchids and carnivorous plants. The area is also noted for its population of rare pygmy pitch pines and other plant species that depends on the frequent uh, fires of the Pine Barrens to reproduce. The sand that composes much of the area's, area's uh, soil is referred to by the locals as sugar sand. The Pine Barrens Territory helps recharge the 17 trillion gallon Kirkwood Cohansey Aquifer. Uh, it contains some of, the, uh, pure, some of the purest water in the United States. As a result of all these factors, in 1978, Congress passed a legislation to designate 1.1 million acres of the Pine Barrens as the Pinelands National Reserve. It was the nation's first natural reserve, uh, and that was to preserve its ecology. A decade later, it was designed by the United Nations as an in, uh, international biosphere res, uh, reserve. Development in the Pinelands National Reserve is strictly controlled by an independent state and federal agency, the New Jersey Pinelands Commission. The Pinelands Reserve contains the Wharton, Brendan T. Byrne, uh, which was formerly Lebanon, Penn and Bass River State forests. So that was Wharton, Brendan T. Byrne, Penn, and Bass River States. The reserve also includes two national wild and scenic rivers, the Maurice and the Great Egg Harbor. Uh, now, as for why this was on the list for hauntings, there are a few ghostly sightings in the area. One being a young boy that was uh, killed by a hit and run on Burnt Mill Road in the, uh, in the Atco area. He's said to roam the roads looking for his killer. And also, if you're going down Burnt Mill Road and you turn your lights off, you may very well see him chasing a ball. So, him chasing a ball and seeing him roaming and, and, and the you know the knowledge of, of, of him being killed by a hit and run kind of, I, I, I assume it was just a, a young boy, you know, out playing next to the road, the ball gets away from him, he goes after it and gets hit by by a car. And whoever it was that hit him 
didn't stop. I could absolutely see why he's wanting to, uh, you know, find his killer. That would, you know, you hit a kid and you don't stop. But I mean, that was that was years ago. So who? I mean, the world may never know who it was, but you know. Um. There's another, uh, another ghostly sighting, and that's of a nam of, of a nam of a man named James Still. Uh, Mr. Steele was an African-American doctor who practiced medicine during the times of slavery. And according to local legend, he was lynched when the townsfolk found out that he was practicing medicine. That being said, though he kind of did, he did absolutely die a violent way, uh, he is not considered evil or malicious. Uh, he's more of a guide to help people uh, who get lost find their way back to, you know, kind of get their bearings and whatnot. That's I, to me. That's that's pretty impressive that he was killed for being a good person, and even in death, that that mentality of of help people kind of carried over for him. I like that. Um, other ghosts include a blonde woman, a white stag, a black dog, and the headless spirit of the infamous pirate Captain Kidd. Of course, with the milling industry being incredibly dangerous, many spirits of, uh, you know, the workers that got killed doing their jobs may linger as well. Now, to tell you all that, just to tell you this, the most infamous entity spotted in the Pine Barrens is the Jersey Devil. Legend says that the demonic creature was the 13th child of Deborah Leeds, Born in 1735, the literal spawn of Satan. This creepy cryptid is said to have wings and hooves with a horse-like head, claws, a forked tail, and a blood-curling scream. Many South Jersey residents have spotted the beast. Reports of Jersey Devil sightings date back to 1820 when Joseph Bonaparte, who was the brother of Napoleon, by the way, claimed to have witnessed the Jersey Devil on his Bordentown estate. The creature was blamed for livestock killings in the 1840s and again in the 1920s. The most incident, uh, the most famous incident of uh, panic over the Jersey Devil occurred in 1909. In the month of January, hundreds of sightings were spotted along with attacks in Haddon Heights and Camden. Newspaper coverage led to the widespread hysteria and a $10,000 bounty was put on the creature's head. Schools were even closed for a short amount of time. Kind of needed something like that back in, you know, back in my days of school. Jersey Devil shows up. Hey, hey, let's shut down school for a little bit. But, you know, that be, you know, saying, should let's shut down school. I mean, back when I was in school, it took, took quite a bit for us to get out of school. It seems like these days I've got, you know, I've got one kid in school and, Seems like they'll shut it down for just about anything they can they can think to do for it, but uh, so you know, in, in terms of the Pine Barrens, just to kind of get back on this, um, we're looking at a haunted highway and a ghost town all in one. Uh, let me know what you think about the Pine Barrens, and uh, we'll move on. Um, our second ghost town brings us to Coaba, Alabama. Uh, it was the first state capital of Alabama from 1820 to 1825. Located at the confluence of the Alabama and the Cahaba Rivers, uh, it did happen to suffer regular season uh, seasonal flooding. And that's part of why, that, well, that is, that is exactly why it only lasted as the uh, state capital for five years. Um, it's also known as Alabama's most haunted ghost town. Uh, once it was no longer the capital of Alabama, the town was abandoned. Now only ghosts live there. Cahaba was first established in 1819. It was built on the remnants of an even earlier ghost town, a Mississippian Native American village dating back to the 16th century, formerly sat at the convergence of the Alabama and Cahaba rivers, and Gover Governor William White Bibb had plans to build a Alabama's first state house directly atop the 300-year-old Indian Mound. Uh, maybe at that time they didn't learn anything. You know, that's that's 
we're right back to it. Here's another uh, another Indian Indian burial mound, and we're gonna build on top of it. So no one's ever gonna learn. Um, Bib did he, Bib died before his uh, plan was realized, and a less imposing state house was eventually completed on an adjacent lot. So after he passed away, I guess people were like, you know, let's put this on an adjacent lot. Let's not, you know insult the native people we we ran out by burying on on one or by, by building on one of their burial mounds now according to site director linda Derry, uh a 19 uh eighteen twenty five was actually a drought year and that it wasn't flooding from that year that caused kawaba to no longer become or no longer remain the 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 capital of Alabama. Uh, Cahaba thrived on an economy of cotton and slavery until the Civil War, and in 1860, Dallas County, uh, which contains Cahaba and, and, and nearby Selma, uh, it was the fourth wealthiest county in the entire United States per capita. That was slaves included. Uh, but yeah, that was... it was. I think the way it reads, it sounds like slavery was kind of the thing, or well, not slavery. The Civil War was kind of what, what kind of led to Cahaba being a ghost town. Uh, remnants of impressive brick mansions and businesses from this period, like the columns that remain from a mansion built in the, uh, built by the Kosharan brothers, can still be found at the site. Uh, so not much, so much as a flood as it was the Civil War that saw the end of Cahaba. Uh, much of the town was eventually brought out by Confederate veteran Samuel Kirkpatrick and converted into a farm. Uh, and it remained a farm until it too was abandoned in the 1930s. With the exceptional occasion of occasional hunters and fishermen, uh, the well, it remained abandoned with the exception of occasional hunters and fishermen. Sorry about that. Kind of. Messed up my notes there. Uh, in the 1980s, the Alabama Historic Commission began excavations on the site. Uh, these days, you can do ghost story or ghost tours on the abandoned town, um, and with rich history of the place comes plenty of stories. As for hauntings, the groundskeepers often heard voices talking to them while they worked. Uh, school groups have also recorded unusual sounds as they did uh, as they studied the tombstones. Photographers and videographers have also filmed in the cemetery uh, that have also filmed in, in the cemetery have reported unexplained lights or shadows in their images. The guides also talk about encounters they've had and could not explain. Uh, here's one story from InspiredSoutherner.com. One of the scariest stories we were told was about Herbert, the grandson of one of the de descendants of the Kirkpatrick. Or was it Kilpatrick or Kirkpatrick? I could have sworn it said Kirkpatrick up here. Give me just a second. I'm going to back up just, <laughs> just a quick second. So I've got Kirkpatrick in one spot and Kilpatrick in the other. I think it was actually Kilpatrick now that I say that. It seems like, uh, seems like when I read it, I was like, I... Kilpatrick didn't jump out quite like it because I've heard the name Kirkpatrick. Uh, so I think it was actually Samuel Kilpatrick. And uh, Herbert, one of the descendants of the Kilpatrick family, uh, spent the summer with his grandfather at the uh, at Old Cahaba. And when he returned home, he told countless stories about, the, uh, about Gat, the gentleman at Old Cahaba, who watched over him while he roamed the grounds. Herbert's brother told him it was uh, impossible for Gat to have watched over him because Gat died before he was born. So, uh, what do you think? Haunted ghost town or just a place with rich history and a lot of stories? Uh, let me know what you think. Our third destination brings us to Bodie, California. Bodie is a ghost town in the Bodie Hills east of the Sierra Nevada mountain range in Mono County, California. Uh, it's about 75 miles southeast of Lake Tahoe and 12 miles east, uh, 12 miles southeast, uh, east southeast of Bridgeport. 
Uh, Bodie became a boom town in 1876 after the discovery of a profitable, profitable line of gold. By 1879, it had a population between 7,000 and 10,000 people. So, you know, it's another product of the gold rush. The town went into decline in the subsequent decades and uh, came to be described as a ghost town by 1915. Which, I mean, hey, that's, you know, for the gold rush, I mean, that is, what is that, 40 some odd years that it, uh, or 35, not quite 40. Um, not too bad, but I mean, you see that a lot, especially out west with the, with the whole gold, gold rush thing that went on. The U.S. Department of Interior uh, recognizes the designated Bodie Historic District as a National Historic Landmark. Also registered as California as a California Historical Landmark, the ghost town officially was established as Bodie State Historic Park in, Park in 1962. It receives about 200,000 visitors yearly. Bodie State Historic Park is partly supported by the Bodie Foundation. Bodie began as a mining camp of little note following the discovery of gold in 1859, and that was by a, a group of pros prospectors, including W.S. Bodie. Uh, Bodie died in a blizzard the following November while making a supply trip to Monoville, uh, which is near present-day Mono City. Uh, never really, you know, named after him, but he never got to see the uh, the rise of the town. As a bustling gold mining center, Bodie had the amenities of larger towns including a Wells Fargo bank, four volunteer fire companies, a brass band, railroad, miners, and mechanics union. Union. I don't know what a union is. <laughs> mechanics union. Several daily newspapers and a jail. At its peak, 65 saloons lined Main Street, which was a mile long. Murders, shootouts, Barroom ball, brawls. Barroom balls. <laughs> Barroom brawls and stagecoach holdups were regular occurrences. As with other remote mining towns, Bodie had a popular though clandestine red light district on the north end of town. Reading that makes me think. So I always go back to it. I'm a big fan of Supernatural. And I always think, whenever I, you know, was getting my notes and I read that part, I immediately thought about the part where um, Sam and Dean go back in time to meet uh, Samuel Colt. Um, I believe it was Samuel Colt. It seems like it had something, about, and someone else. I don't remember who the other person was that they had to deal with. Anywho, and I always think of how Dean was just like, yeah, <laughs> Old West Town and Red Light District, and of course, you know, that's back in the area era, era where you know, STDs ran rampant and dental care wasn't quite up to par and he was like, what's up? And they turn around and he's like, ugh. <laughs> no, I, I just, that that just, that pops into my mind every time I see that. Um, there's an unsubsta uh, unsubstanti unsubstantiated story of Rosa May, a prostitute who, in the style of Florence Nightingale, came to the aid of the town's, uh, the menfolk of the town when a serious epidemic struck the town at the height of its boom. She's credited with giving life-saving care to many, but after she died, she was buried outside the cemetery fence. So good enough to care for them, not good enough to be buried with them. Bodie also had a cemetery on the outskirts of town and the nearby mortuary, and a nearby mortuary. It's the only building in the town of red brick, uh, three uh, of built of red brick three courses thick most likely for insulation to keep the air temperature steady during cold winters and hot summers uh, the cemetery includes a miners union section a cenotaph uh, erected to honor president james a garfield uh, the bodie boot hill was located outside of the official city cemetery on main street stands the miners union hall which was a meeting place for labor unions it also served as an entertainment center that hosted dances, concerts, plays, and school recitals. And these days, it just kind of serves as a museum. 
The first signs of decline started to appear in 1880 and became obvious towards the end of the year. Uh, promising mining boons in Butte, Montana, Tombstone, Arizona, and Utah lured men away from Bodie. The get-rich-quick single miners who came to the town in the 1870s moved to these other boom towns, and Bodie developed into a family-oriented community. In 1882, residents built the Methodist Church, which still stands, and the Roman Catholic Church. It unfortunately does not. It got burned down in about 1930. Uh, despite the population decline, the mines were flourishing, and in 1881, Bodie's ore production was at a record high of 3.1 million. Also, in 1881, a narrow gauge railroad was built called the Brody Wet Railway and Lumber Company, bringing lumber, cordwood, and mine timbers to the mining district from Mono Hills uh, south of Mono Lake, Mono Mills. Excuse me. The last mine closed in 1942 due to War Production Board Order L-208, shutting down all non-essential gold mines in the United States during World War II. Uh, mining never resumed after the war, and Bodie was first described as a ghost town in 1915. In a time when auto travel was on the rise, many travelers reached Bodie via automobiles. The San Francisco Chronicle published an article in 1919 to dispute the ghost town label. So, I mean, this place was a ghost town, but I guess the uh, some people didn't, didn't quite like that. Uh, by 1920, Bodie's population was recorded by the, federal, uh, the U.S. federal census at a total of 120 people. Uh, despite the decline and the severe uh, fire in the business district in 1932, Bodie had a permanent residence through nearly half of the 20th century. A post office operated at Bodie from 1877 to 1942. There is actually a story more or less regarding the post office that I'm going to go into here shortly that I think you're actually going to really, not necessarily a story, more of just a, a little something something that had that was related to that that I think you're really going to enjoy. Uh, today, Bodie is, a, is preserved in a state of arrested decay. Only a small part of the town survived with about 110 structures still standing, including one of many once operational gold mills, uh, uh, including one of many op once operational gold mills. Uh, visitors can walk the deserted streets of a town that once uh, was a bustling area of activity. Interiors remain as they were left and stocked with goods. Littered throughout the park, one can find small shards of china dishes, square nails, and the occasional bottle. But removing these items is against the rules of the park. In 2009 and again in 2010, Bodie was scheduled to be closed. The California State Legislature worked out a, a budget compromise that enabled the, state, uh, the state's parks uh, closure commission to keep it open. As of 2019, the park is still operating, uh, now administered by Bodie Foundation. I, I didn't see anything saying it had been closed since then that I can remember. So... Um, I mean, you know, so I guess even as of 19 and moving forward, it is still open. Legends about Bodhi include the Bodhi curse. Supposedly, if visitors take anything from the old ghost town, like right down to a pebble, they'll be cursed with bad luck. Uh, misfortune and tragedy are heaped upon the victim until stolen item, uh, the stolen item is returned. And according to park rangers, many who have taken things eventually return them to the park and rid themselves of this curse. Uh, purportedly, the park maintains a logbook of pages and pages of returned items. In the museum, you can see the letters from people who've returned the items to the park. And the curse is supposedly perpetuated by the ghost of Bodhi who guard against thieves uh, and protect his treasure. That is however, believed to be a superstition started by the park rangers to deter people from theft. Other ghostly legends seemingly occurred in the ghost town that is said to, uh, well, let's see. 
Other ghostly legends have seemingly occurred in the ghost town that is said to be a tr uh, be truly a ghost town, um, remaining home to several restless spirits. Uh, the J.S. Kane house at the corner of Green and Park Streets is said to be haunted by the ghost of a Chinese maid. Families of park rangers who have occupied the house describe the, the spirit as not liking adults, but loves when children visit. Adults sleeping at the house have said that they will awake in the night to find a heavyset Chinese woman sitting on them. Feeling suffocated, one woman fought so hard that she ended up on the floor. Now that, I kind of wonder if that's someone who, who has, um, what is that called? Now I can't remember. I talk about it all the time and now I can't remember what it's called. Um, sleep paralysis. And having known that story, kind of conjured that up. Uh, others have reported seeing the bedroom door opening and closing on its own. And the Gregory house is also said to be haunted by the ghost of an old woman. Guests and staff have reported seeing her sitting in a rocking chair knitting an afghan. At other times, the rocking chair has been seen rocking on its own accord. The Mendocini house is also called uh, home to several friendly ghosts. One is thought to be Mrs. Mendocini, who loved to cook her Italian food. Uh, Rangers report today that they often smell the delicious aroma of her cooking when they enter the house. Others have reported party-like sounds coming from the next room and, and, and uh, the laughter of children. At the Dochambeau house, Dochambeau? At the Dochambeau house, visitors have seen a woman peering from an upstairs window. And at the Bodhi Cemetery is the Angel of Bodhi, a three-year-old child that was said to have been accidentally killed when she was hit in the head by a miner's pick. Her grave is mounted with a white marble angel, and on one occasion a man visiting the cemetery with his little girl noticed that she was giggling and seemingly uh, playing with an unseen entity. So, maybe that was... Uh, Maybe that was the, the angel of Bodhi. You know, it seems like seems to me like kids are always attracted or not or well, child ghosts, children child spirits are always attracted to children. And uh, I'll talk about I'll I'll go more into that one day whenever I discuss a place that I've actually done an investigation on. But um, as for Bodhi, let me know what you think of the stories. You know whether or not you believe that uh, that the place was haunted, or maybe if it's just a a product of a of a of a mining town that's no longer in use. Our fourth stop brings us to Calico, California, another mining town in the West. Uh, Calico is a ghost town and former mining town in the San Bern uh, Bernardino County uh, in San Bernardino County, California. Uh, Located in the Calico Mountains of the Mojave Desert region of Southern California, it was founded in 1881 as a silver mining town and was later converted into a county park named Calico Ghost Town. Located on I-15, uh, it lies three miles from Barstow and three miles from Yermo. Giant letters spelling Calico are visible from the highway on the Calico Peaks behind it. Uh, Walter Knott purchased, uh, purchased Calico in the 1950s and architecturally restored all but the five remaining original buildings to look as they did in the 1880s. Uh, Calico received California's historical landmark number 870 or 782. I can't read numbers sometimes. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. 782 and in 2005 was proclaimed by the by then governor Arnold Schwarzenegger to be California's Silver Rush ghost town. In 1881, four prospects were leaving Grapevine Station, which is present-day Barstow, uh, for, a mountain, for a mountain peak to the northeast. After they described the peak as calico-colored, the peak... Uh, what is that? Uh, the mountain. The mountain range to which it belonged and the town that followed were all... Co okay, so I get what that's saying. After they, descri they described the peak as calico-colored, the peak, the mountain range which it belonged to, and the town that followed were all called Calico. 
The four prospectors discovered silver in the mountains and opened the Silver King Mine, which was California's largest silver-producing mine in the, uh, the mid-1880s. Uh, John C. King, who had grub-staked the prospectors who discovered the silver vein, uh, was the uncle of Walter Knott, founder of Knott's Berry Farm. King was sheriff of San Bernardino, uh, San Bernardino County from 1879 to 1882. A post office at Calico was established in early 1882, and the Calico Print, a weekly newspaper, started publishing. Now, during Bodie, I said I had a story for you later on, but I actually think that may be part of Calico. The, the, the story is like, you know, I got one that I'll go into that I think you'll enjoy. I think that's actually part of Calico. I got my places mixed up. Uh, the town soon supported three hotels, five general stores, a meat market, bars, brothels, and three restaurants and boarding houses. The county established a school district and a voting precinct. The town also had a deputy sheriff and two constables, two lawyers and a justice of the peace, five commissioners, and two doctors. There was also a Wells Fargo office and a telephone and telegraph service. At its height of silver production during 1883 and 1885, Calico had over 500 mines and a population of 1,200 people. Local bad men were buried in the Boot Hill Cemetery. The discovery of the borate mineral, Colomite, in the Calico Mountains a few years after the settlement of the town also helped Calico's fortunes. And in the uh, 1890s, the estimated population of the town was about 3,500, with nationals of China, England, Ireland, Greece, France, and the Netherlands, as well as Americans. In the same year, the Silver Purchase Act was enacted and drove, the town, uh, drove down the price of silver. By 1896, its value had de decreased to 57 cents per troy ounce, and Calico silver mines were no longer economically viable. The post office was discontinued in 1898, and the school closed not long after. By the turn of the century, Calico was all but a ghost town. And with the end of borax mining in the region in 1907, the town was completely abandoned. Many of the original buildings were moved to Barstow, Daggett, and Yermo. So this place, this place boomed and then died just about as quickly as, as it kind of like it come up overnight and then crumbled overnight. But that was a product of the time during the gold and silver rushes. Um, an attempt to revive the town was made in 1915 when a cyanide plant was built to recover silver from the unpro uh, unprocessed Silver King's mine, King Mines, Silver King Mines deposits. Walter Knott and his wife, there's Walter again, <clears throat> founders of Knott's Berry Farm, were homesteaded at Newberry Springs around this time and Knott helped build the redwood cyanide tanks for the plant. The last owner of Calico as a mine was the Zenda Mining Company. After building Ghost Town at Knott's, Ferry, uh, Knott's Berry Farm in the 1940s, Walter Knott, his son Russell, and Paul Von Kleben, who was Knott's art director, made a road trip to Calico. The three of them came back filled with enthusiasm. If they could buy and uh, build, if they could buy, if they could build an imaginary ghost town at Knott's Berry Farm, would it not be possible to restore a real ghost town? In 1951, Walter Knott purchased the town of Calico from the Zenda Mining Company and put Paul Von Kleben in charge of restoring it to its original condition, referencing old photographs. So he basically rebuilt an entire ghost town just off of photographs alone. That's impressive. Uh, using the old photos and Walter's memory and uh, that of some old timers who still lived in the area, Von Kleben was able to not only restore existing structures, but also design and replace missing buildings. Not spent $700,000 restoring Calico. Now think about that, that was in the 1950s. $700,000, that's insane. I'm not going to do any sort of math because, I mean, honestly, $700,000 just 
you know, just 70 years ago has to be, with the way inflation's gone, has to be, <laughs> I don't know, $100 million. I don't really know. It's a random number. Uh, Knott's installed a longtime employee named Freddie Calico Fred Noller as a resident caretaker and official greeter. In 1966, Walter Knott decided to donate the town to San Bernardino County, and Calico became a county regional park. <clears throat> Calico is another mining town with its fair share of spirits that dwell there. Excuse me. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, one of the most often cited spirits is that of Lucy Bell King Lane, a woman who spent nearly 70 years of her life there. When mining was on the decline, she and her husband left in 1899 only to return in 1916. Lucy passed away in 1967. Almost six, day, uh, six decades have passed since her death, but she's still seen walking the grounds between her home and the old store that she and her husband ran. When she is spotted, she's described as wearing a long black dress, most likely the very lace that she was buried in. Her favorite rocking chair is also seen, uh, said, been said to rock on its own, uh, and often pictures are taken off the wall at night, only to be found the next morning in a neat pile on the floor. At Lane's old store, clerks have often heard unexplainable noises and catch movement out of the corner of their eyes, uh, which they also attribute to Lucy. Uh, the Lane House was the longest occupied original structure in Calico. Now, that being said, Lucy Lane is not the only phantom that lurks in Calico. At the schoolhouse sitting atop the hill in Calico, some people have reported seeing a little girl around 11, 12 years old, uh, most often smiling through a window. Sometimes she even leans out and waves at uh, people passing by. Others have allegedly seen phantom school teachers and another small child who's been known to grab people's legs or pinch their ankles. So one that likes to wave and one that likes to cause mischief. Some visitors have also reported seeing a floating red light inside the school. Another story is one of two British tourists who reportedly having a long visit with a staff person in a period costume who explained to them that she was the last teacher in Calico. As they were ready to leave, they had pictures taken with the self-proclaimed teacher. The last, school mistress in Calico, the last school mistress in Calico was Margaret Oliver. Or is it Olivier? Uh, Margaret Olivier, who passed away in 1932 and is buried in the Calico Cemetery. When the couple returned home and got their pictures developed, they were amazed to see the staff member didn't appear in the photos. Later, they found that there had been no staff members working at the schoolhouse during their visit. Also said to haunt Calico's boardwalks on Main Street is that of its last marshal, Marshall, Marshall, <laughs> last marshal, Tumbleweed Harris. Another spectral lady in a long white dress has frequently been seen walking near the outskirts of the ghost town and at the buildings that once housed the town theater, which is now the R&D Fossil and Mineral Shop. Another female ghost named Esmeralda has allegedly also been seen. Coming up to the part I think you'll enjoy. <laughs> uh, finally, Calico had another famous resident that of Dorsey the mail carrying dog. Dorsey was found in 1883 by postmaster Jim Stacy when the hungry and footsore uh, black and white shepherd was lying on his porch. I thought I, I can't see this morning. I thought that said back and wild. I, I think I messed something up. No. So uh, Dorsey was found in 1883 by postmaster Jim Stacy when the hungry and footsore black and white shepherd was laying on his porch. Stacy quickly adopted him, and Dorsey became his faithful friend. In addition to his postmaster duties, Stacy was interested in the mine in nearby Bismarck. <clears throat> Dorsey's legend was revived in a 1972 album entitled The Ballad of Calico by Kenny Rogers. 
The song was called Dorsey the Mail Carrying Dog, and of course, in Haunted Calico, he's been revived in another way, the Spectral Dog. On several occasions, Dorsey has been seen as a shadow-like apparition at the cemetery and near the print shop that stands near the uh, original location of the post office. So, what do you think about Calico? The ghost town with the ghost, uh, the ghost dog mail carrier. Um, if you want to read more up on that, a lot of most of these places I've just I, I Google the location. Um, so if you want to read more on Dorsey, just Google Dorsey the mail carrying dog. Had it looked like it had tons of stories about him, but uh, you know this this particular episode is already closing in on forty minutes, and by the time I got to Calico, I was like, this is gonna be a long episode, so. Uh, just I kind of wanted to just make a mention of him, even though I did find that really funny that that there was actually a dog, and he apparently made some pretty long treks carrying the mail. You know, it wasn't like he was just going across the street here, here, buddy, take that one over there. Now he was he was actually pretty good about doing his job. Anywho, let me know what you think about Calico and Dorsey. Now, our fifth and final destination is. Centralia, Pennsylvania. For me, probably the most famous. Fa- mo- For me, probably the most famous ghost town in America. Centralia is a borough and near ghost town in Columbia County, Pennsylvania. Its population has declined from a thousand, one thousand, in 1980 to five residents in 2020 because a coal mine fire has been burning beneath the borough since uh, 1962. Centralia, part of the Bloomsburg, Berwick metropolitan area, is the least populated municipality in Pennsylvania. It's completely surrounded by Conningham Township. <clears throat> Many Native American tribes in what is now Columbia County sold the land to make up Centr- uh, that makes up Centralia to local colonial agents in the in 1749 for about 500 pounds. In 1770, during the construction of the uh, the Reading Road, uh, the Reading Road, which stretched from Reading to Fort Augusta, which is present-day Sunbury, settlers surveyed and explored the land. A large portion of Reading Road was developed later as Route 61, the main highway east into in in an, into and south east into and south out of Centralia. In 1793, Robert Morris, a hero of the Revolutionary War and a signatory, uh, uh, signatory? That's a, that's a new word for me. Signatory of the Declaration of Independence acquired a third of Centralia's valley land. When he declared bankruptcy in 1798, the land was surrendered to the Bank of the United States. A French sea captain named Stephen Gerard purchased Morris's land for $30,000, including 68 tracks east of Morris. He had learned that there was an uh, anthracite coal that there was anthracite coal in the region. The first two mines in Centralia opened up in 1856, the Locust Run Mine and the Coal Ridge Mine. Afterward came the uh, Hazeldale Col- uh, Colliery Mine in 1860, the Centralia Mine in 1862, and the Continental Mine in 1863. The Continental was located on Stephen Gerard's former estate, branching from the Lee Valley Railroad. Uh, the Lee and Mahoney Railroad was constructed to Centralia in uh, 1865. It enabled transport and expansion of Centralia's coal sales uh, to market in eastern Pennsylvania. Centralia was incorporated as a borough in 1866. Its principal employer was the anthracite coal industry, uh, Alexander Ray, the town's founder. What the crap? This is all over the place. Okay. Centralia was incorporated as a borough in 1866. Its principal employer was the anthracite coal industry. Alexander Ray, the town's founder, was murdered in his buggy by members of the Molly <laughs> the Molly Maguires on October 17, 1868, during a trip between Centralia and Mount Carmel. 
Three men were eventually convicted of, of his death and were hanged in the county seat of Bloomsburg on March 25th, 1878. <clears throat> Several other murders and incidents of arson also took place during the... Uh, during, during this time, Miss Centralia was a hotbed for Molly McGuire's activity in the 1860s to organize a, mi a mine workers' union in order to improve wages and working conditions. A legend among, among locals in Centralia tells that Father Daniel Ignatius McDermott, the first Roman Catholic priest to call Centralia home, cursed the land in retaliation for being assaulted by three members of the, of the McGuire's in 1869. You don't assault a priest. That's just asking for trouble. <laughs> especially in that time period. Uh, McDermott said there would be a day when St. Ignatius Roman Catholic Church would be the only structure remaining in Centralia, and many of the Molly Maguire's leaders were hanged in 1877, ending their crimes. Legends say that a number of descendants of the Molly Maguire still lived, up, uh, lived in Centralia up until the late, uh, well not the late, up until the 1980s. Mining continued in Centralia until the 1960s when most of the company shut down. Bootleg mining continued until 1982. Sorry, I jumped ahead there. According to numbers of federal census records, the town of Centralia reached its maximum population of 2,761 in, in 1890. Excuse me. At its peak, the town had seven churches, five hotels, 27 saloons, two theaters, a bank, a post office, and 14 general and grocery stores. 37 years later, the production of anthracite coal had reached its peak in Pennsylvania. In the following years, production declined as many young miners from Centralia enlisted in the military and entered World War I. Mining continued in Centralia until the 1960s when most companies shut down. Bootleg mining continues continued uh, mining continued until 1982, and strip and open pit minings are still active in the area. An underground mine about three miles to the west employs about 40 people. On May 27th, 1962, the firefighters, as they had in the past, set the dump on fire and let it burn for some time. Uh, this is kind of going into the story of how the fire got started. Um, <clears throat> unlike in previous years, however, the fire was not fully extinguished. An unsealed opening in the pit allowed the fire to enter the labyrinth of abandoned coal mines under Centralia. In 1979, locals became aware of the scale of the problem when a gas station owner, then Mayor John Coddington, inserted a dipstick into one of his underground tanks to check the fuel level. When he withdrew it, it seemed hot. He lowered the thermometer into the tank on a string and was shocked to discover the temperature of the gasoline tank was about 172 degrees Fahrenheit. Moving on, a few other things that happened due to the fire. A 12-year-old resident named Tom uh, Dombrowski fell... Uh, is that right? Dumbo Domboski fell into a sinkhole caused by the underground fire that opened right under his feet. His cousin, 14-year-old Eric Wolfgang, pulled him out of the uh, hole and saved his life. The plume of hot steam billowing from the hole was tested and found to contain a lethal level of carbon monoxide. At the time of the sinkhole collapse, then-incumbent uh, then uh, Representative James Nelligan and Governor Dick Thornburg were visiting the town to assess the area. In 18, <clears throat> excuse me, in 1983, the U.S. Congress allocated more than $42 million for relocation efforts. Nearly all the residents accepted the government's buyout offers. More than 1,000 people moved out of the town and 500 structures were demolished. By 1990, the census recorded 63 remaining residents. From there, the population continued to dwindle until Centralia became a ghost town. As of 2020, only five residents live there. Though Centralia is one of the most famous ghost towns in America, it isn't necessarily one of the most haunted. 
Most stories of the hauntings tend to center around the stories of strange shadow figures and apparitions seen moving around the buildings that have now been abandoned. Its biggest claim to fame, aside from ever being uh, from the ever-burning underground coal fire, is that it was used as the inspiration for the popular video game turned movie Silent Hill. <clears throat> so, Centralia, which it's funny because Centralia was to me, without a doubt, the most famous ghost town. Without a doubt the most famous ghost town and that could be from being a kid watching my brother play Silent Hill and I say watching because I was never good at, at survival horror games so you know I'd usually just watch him play and then have nightmares <laughs> um, that being said with it being one of the most famous I'm surprised I couldn't find a lot of things in terms of hauntings other than the shadow figures mentioned and whatnot. but either way <clears throat> um it was. It's still one of my favorite to read about. It's still one of my favorite to hear about. May go look for more information on Calico. I, the the whole mail carrying dog still cracks me up. But uh, that's all for this week's episode. And thank you so much for taking this trip on these winding roads with me. Uh, sorry about the missed couple of weeks. Uh, we had a bit of a crazy week a couple weeks ago, um, but hopefully we're back on track. And you know, for those of you that have reached out, just you know, or just or just at work, run into me and been like, "Hey, didn't see an episode." Kind of starting to, to <laughs> kind of starting to to get a little bit worried here. What's going on? We're back, and uh, like I was saying at the start of the episode, I do plan on adding a little bit of uh, extras to this. I'm off for the next week. So I'm going to try and get a little backlog of things recorded that I can that I can put out throughout the week. Um, but, you know, for anybody who reached out and want to know what was going on, why they hadn't seen a new episode, like I say, we just had a couple crazy, just crazy busy weeks. Um, I'm back now, and I figured to, I guess my way of apologizing for not I guess not uploading for a few weeks is to give you an episode that's damn near an hour long I didn't think this was going to be this long but uh, I was expecting maybe 30-35 minutes and I feel like you can tell here at the end of the video that my voice is trying to give out um, I've been kind of hacking towards the end of it and <laughs> getting a lot of water and stuff. I've just about went through this entire bottle of water next to me. Just trying to keep my voice going. Um, but thank you so much for listening today. And um, I do want to say that these days, if you want to reach out to me, you can look me up on Twitter. Actually, I've got a Twitter going these days. Um, and that is at uh, Full Moon Empty RD. You can find me on Twitter there. Uh, you can find me on Instagram now, which I've not really done much in terms of uploads on Instagram. Uh, I just I kind of just had to get it created, and that was uh, about as far as I wanted to go um, for for now. For now, I'll uh, I'll start trying to post on there a little bit more often. Uh, but you can find me on Instagram at FMER Podcast. Uh, the same with uh, Facebook. There is a Facebook page, FMER Podcast. And I hope that didn't pick that up just then because that was my stomach growling. <laughs> and you can also find me on TikTok. And you can find me there at. I'm trying to get that exact link right now uh, you can just search full moon empty road it doesn't look like TikTok actually uses a uh, like an at thing like Twitter and Instagram do and and Facebook so uh, yeah go follow me on social media and feel free to you know feel free to post on those feel free to f to engage with me and everything because um, I always love hearing from the people who enjoy listening. Uh, you can also uh, drop me a line 
at fullmoonemptyroad at gmail.com. And guys, let me know what you'd like to hear. I actually picked out the ghost towns on my own, and I've got an idea of another one. But uh, kind of, but that one will probably be in a couple of weeks because I don't like to do because I started out with history and hauntings, and then kind of added dark words, dark things. So I, I kind of want to space out the dark words, dark things because I can. To me, history and hauntings is a lot. There's a lot more content to that, even though the dark words, dark things, since it's more of a list form, goes on for a longer point of the episode. But uh, let me know what you'd want to hear, like a location. Um, you know, just let me know, drop me a line, reach out to me on social media. And, uh, before we go, go visit Tiffany at the Vinyl and Sublime Company. She can do all things from decal shirts, tumblers, mugs, and much, much more. Uh, she's created the first Full Moon Empty Road t-shirt, which you can find at her Etsy shop, the Vinyl and Sublime Co. Uh, she even does custom orders. To request a custom order, you can email, text, or use the request a custom order at her Etsy shop. Uh, So drop her a line at thevinylandsublimeco at gmail.com or shoot a text to 706-913-7837 to get started on your custom order today. Go now and tell her I sent you. Also, there is a Uh, 10% discount code for anybody who is listening who wants to buy something from her. That discount code is HAUNTED10, H-A-U-N-T-E-D-1-0. And I just want to say one more time, thank you guys so much for sticking it out with me. And thank you for coming back after no uploads for a couple weeks. I love and appreciate every one of you. Now, let's go home.